All right, so we'll, we'll have an, a week extension. And so that should be roughly the last day of you know, classes or, you know, a few days, I think a weekend after classes end. Okay? And I'll post that on the website. Okay, so let's get back to the topic at hand. Uh, last lecture, we started talking about comparators. And uh, as you'll remember, comparator is a circuit that compares an input voltage, it could be a single-ended voltage or a differential voltage, to some reference level and uh, makes a decision as to whether the input signal is larger or smaller than the reference. And there's several issues that we talked about last lecture we touched upon, uh, such as how fast you can run this system, uh, what kind of offset it has, in other words, what's the smallest signal you can resolve, which is related to the resolution. Uh, resolution is also related to your gain. So how small can the signal be and still be able to resolve full-scale uh, decision? Um, other more subtle issues, overload recovery, if the system makes a decision, how long does it take it to get out of that decision? Uh, how much input capacitance does it have? How linear are those capacitors? We looked at the example of a flash converter and found the input capacitance was important. And also the linearity of the capacitance comes into play. Um, Finally, of course, and always power dissipation, how much power do we have to consume to build this thing to run it? Um, common mode rejection, again, another issue that uh, was important in the flash converter because we had different common mode levels on the different um, comparators. And important topic we'll touch upon a little more today is kickback noise. The, and kickback noise just means when this device makes a decision, does it dump charge or steal charge away from the input signal? And if it does that, that can be a problem. So one of the reasons that we use this preamp is to minimize the so-called kickback noise. We'll find that latches tend to generate lots of kickback noise. So this input amp also, in addition to reducing the offset voltage, can also reduce the kickback voltage. So you may, might wonder, why not just use a latch, right? Why are we even bothering with this preamp? Okay, and then the example we started with uh, last lecture was uh, something fairly reasonable. Let's say 12-bit, 100 mega sample per second ADC, and we're going to use, let's say, a flash architecture. So we need to resolve signals as small as 240 microvolts, and that translates into a gain of 8,000. And uh, because we're running this fast, we have to make that in a half period, which is about 5 nanoseconds. So, again, we already talked about this, and you know the answer is op-amp is not going to work. Let's calculate <clears throat> the gain bandwidth requirement for an op-amp. Um, the unity gain frequency of our op-amp needs to be the gain uh, divided by the settling time, which we need to make our decision. Settling time is going to be very small, right? If we if we have to make the complete decision in 5 nanoseconds, maybe we can say 1 nanoseconds for the comparator. And that translates into a gain bandwidth product of 1.3 terahertz. So clearly, it'll be a while before we can just use op-amps. And as we discussed last lecture, I mean, inherently there's nothing wrong with an op-amp. It just was not designed to go open loop, right? The op-amp was designed to go closed loop. That's why the 3dB frequency is so low. It's been compensated so that you get the speed when you close the loop. And so uh, it's really the wrong architecture. And then we started looking at, for instance, using multi-stage amplifiers um, without feedback. So the question is, how fast is a cascade of amplifiers like this? Um, and What's the optimal number of stages? So let, let's look at, let's do a, a relatively simple calculation to try to determine how fast this circuit is. I'm going to analyze an even simpler circuit. In fact, it doesn't even matter because at the end of the day, we have transconductances, we have parasitic capacitances. So this is stage one. This is stage two, let's say. 
stage three, and so on. And just for simplicity, we're going to assume that each stage is sized identically. So this is GM1, CP1, this is GM2, CP2, and so on. All right, so how, what, <clears throat> what's a good estimate for this parasitic capacitance? Let's say CPI. Kind of order of magnitude, what's a good number to put in here? Okay, somebody use, want to use a mic? And... Well, that's a good start. Clearly, this CGS is going to play a role, right? So we'll call this CGS I plus 1. But that's not the only capacitance, right? What other capacitance should we include? CGD, and if there's any Miller effect, Miller multiplied CGD. Yeah, yeah, we want to keep things simple. So what we'll do is we'll say plus C more, and let's just say that this is something like maybe two or three times CGS, right? I'm going to get <clears throat> uh, C drain to bulk here for both of these devices, and some Miller cap, and usually CGS is much larger than C drain to bulk. And so it's probably not a bad estimate to say it's maybe two to three times CGS and order of magnitude. So that means the unity gain frequency of the ith stage is on the order of GMI over CPI or maybe on the order of one half, let's just use two, one half omega T of the device. Okay, not too bad. Again, the assumption that, that we're making is that the gain in each stage is not too large, right? Because the gain becomes too large, I have to take Miller effect into account. So if I have low gain, it's not a bad idea. Of course, I could always use cascodes to keep the Miller cap under control, right? So this is not a bad estimate. That means that each, <clears throat> each device has a uh, pole frequency equal to the gain, basically, omega t divided by the gain, which is GMRL. Where RL, of course, is, uh, let's call this RP. Um, RP is the parasitic resistance loading this node. So I'll just call this omega t divided by 2A0. And so the transfer function of the ith stage is some gain A0, 1 plus S over omega P, where omega P is given by this expression. And so now we're going to take a cascade of these. Anybody want to guess what the answer is going to be for the 3 dB frequency of a cascade? Just a guess. They're all, let's say they're identical stages, and I'm just cascading them. Okay, that's a good guess. Let's say that bandwidth shrinks by a factor of n. It's actually not a bad guess. Let's let's see where that where we could go with that. So if I take the total gain, it's the product of identical stages. So I get a naught divided by n plus 1 plus s over omega p times 1 plus s over omega p dot dot dot, right? Multiplying these out. If I make a crude approximation and just keep the first order term, I get 1 over omega p plus 1 over omega p n times, right? And so then your guess is about right. I get s n over omega p. Uh, let's see if we can do a little better than that. We can do a little better uh, because we can just actually take the magnitude of this expression here and set it equal to a naught to the nth power divided by square root of 2, right? And then solve for omega. At this frequency, that is the 3 dB frequency of the whole transfer function. That's equal to a naught to the n 1 plus s over omega p 
product, well, this is just to the nth power, right? Because they're all identical um, magnitude. And so this is equal to A naught <clears throat> 1 plus omega over omega p squared square root to the nth power. And change the order of magnitude and power. And so now I can solve for omega. And I'll spare you guys the two lines of algebra. The answer I get is that omega is equal to the the 3 dB frequency of the overall system is a 3 dB of one stage times some factor, which is 2 to the power of 1 over n minus 1 square root. So this is the bandwidth shrinkage factor, if you like. And you can see it's not linear with n. We can plot out a few different values. Let's call this. Uh... So of course, if I plug in 1, I should get 1, right? Otherwise, I made an algebra error. So 2 minus 1 is 1. That's right. If I plug in 2 with the help of a calculator, I get 0.64. So a little bit better than 1 half, as we predicted. If I put in 3, I get 0.51. Again, a little bit better than 1 third, and so on. So even with five stages, I still have about 40% of the bandwidth of a single stage. Okay, So that tells me that fundamentally this multi-stage amplifier, if I design it right, the bandwidth is going to be some factor. If, if I'm looking at four or five stages, let's say maybe half the bandwidth of a single stage, which is going to be the unity gain frequency, the omega t of the device, um, divided by the gain that I get per stage. Right. Okay. That means that I can make this actually quite a bit fast, much faster than the op amp, right? Because if I use the op amp, what would be the bandwidth be? So here, the omega minus 3 dB is going to be roughly omega t divided by um, a naught times some factor we call it two times another factor of let's say you know one of these factors depending on the number of stages. How does that compare to the op amp? What would the what would this factor here be for the op amp? Yeah, huge. Uh, remember, this is the gain per stage. So the total gain of the op amp, so omega minus 3 dB op amp, would be omega t divided by a naught to the nth power, also times some factor, maybe you know one half, one third, whatever. But you can see that there's clearly a huge difference here. And the difference is that here I've got lots of identical poles sitting on the left half plane, if I put feedback around it, it'll either sing to me or it'll latch, right? But this op amp is designed not to do that. All right, <clears throat> well, the, the next question, okay, so that, that's one way of looking at things. And actually, you might argue that, you know what? I don't like your model. You just did some small signal analysis. In reality, what's wrong with our small signal analysis? You might argue, well, that might apply to the first stage. Maybe you're not, right? Maybe I have a step input on the first stage. Right? So this, this is kind of a very nonlinear circuit. The difference between the reference and the input signal could be small. That's where we need all our gain. But it could also be large, right? I could come back and say, well, that analysis I just did is good because the worst case scenario is when the signal is small. Right, the signal, the difference between the input signal and the reference signal is small. 
that's going to take the longest to decide because I have to gain up the signal in several stages to get to full scale or to get to the threshold of my latch. And if I have a large signal input, then maybe that's not so much of an issue, right? Well, you can look at the problem another way. You could say, well, let me just assume that if I put in a large signal, like a step, each stage just acts like an integrator, right? I have a GM stage, and then I have some capacitance. And I know my first stage, for instance, is going to slew. So the output at some time TD, some delay time, is a slewed version of the input, right? So it ramps up to some value linearly proportional to the time. Um, so this is kind of a, another extreme. Forget the small signal analysis. Let's just assume that everything is internally slewing. And so then the same thing for the second stage. The second stage is also going to slew, but now because its input is not a step but a ramp, we integrate that and we get a square, right? And so on. The next stage sees a parabolic input, and so its output put is cubic <coughs> in time and so on and so forth. And so using this analysis, we can calculate the delay time. And uh, <clears throat> at the end, you know, nth stage, uh, it's going to have an nth power in it. And so again, here we can solve for how long it takes to slew to a certain value. And we get this nice result that, again, it's proportional to unity gain frequency of each stage. Right? We argued before that this cap is on the order of CGS, so this factor here is on the order of omega t. And then we have this factor, and this factor is <coughs> proportional to the nth root of the overall gain. Well, what is that? That's just A0, right? So this is the total gain. If I take the nth root, that's just the gain for one stage. And then I have some nth root of n factorial. That's some constant. So again, the answer looks very similar. It has omega t in it. It has the gain in it, the gain per stage, not the gain of the overall amplifier. And then it has some constant term. <coughs> so I can now plot this gain delay uh, well, actually, this plot is a little different. Um, this plot is the output at some time. Yeah, this is just showing how the integrations go, so forget this. So this is the input ramp. This is the square. This is the cube, and so on. So what I plot here is for a fixed delay, I mean, for a fixed gain, in other words, this is hard to read. I apologize. Uh, can we zoom in on just the plot? So this is, on this axis, we have TD as a function of gain. So we have a gain of 100. So this one here is 100. This one's 1,000. And this one is 10,000. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> this is the number of stages. And the idea here is that as I increase the number of stages, my overall delay goes down. And that may not make sense, but you have to think I'm keeping for a fixed gain. So if I need a gain of a 10,000, I can get that gain out of two stages, right? And the bandwidth would be really bad because I'm getting lots of gain out of few stages. Or I can get that gain out of 10 stages, each with very high bandwidth, because now the gain per stage has gone down considerably. right? And so this tells me that for this very, very simple analysis uh, that we've done, there is an optimum number of stages. And it's somewhere on the order of, let's say, 4 or 5 or something like that. For this large range of gain settings, um, it's a very shallow <coughs> minimum meaning that if I'm off a little bit, things don't change much. So if I design for six stages and I actually, um, because of process variations, move around a bit, I'm still going to get the same delay. 
Well, you can do this mathematically. You can take this expression, take its derivative with respect to the number of stages, uh, and find the optimum number of stages. And uh, if you plug in here uh, an example number, I think this is for our example, you get about three stages being optimum. Questions or comments? Is it gain per stage or number of stages, the number you recorded? Um yeah, I'm sorry, I'm <clears throat> you're you're right. This is the this is number of stages and then this is in turn the gain per stage. Thank you. So a gain of about three per stage, roughly. Um, this analysis, though, of course, is very simple. So if, if, if you go and build this and look at it in SPICE, the curves will look a lot more complicated. And uh, what you'll find is that actually, because of the higher order effects that we've neglected here, this curve does tend to bend up. And... <clears throat> So in, in practice, most people will not use too many stages, maybe just two or three stages. And that will be pretty much kind of a safe design. Let me just say one more thing about this design. And that has to do with offset voltage. So, so if I if I design these amplifiers, let's say they're fully differential amplifiers, I'm going to end up with some overall offset, and I can model that as some equivalent input offset voltage. And this, as we discussed last lecture, uh, if the gain gets too high, then ultimately we're going to be limited by the offset voltage of the amplifier. Um, let me show you guys a technique to get rid of this offset voltage. And this is, again, just a very quick overview. Uh, we're going to talk about the general concept of offset cancellation in a separate lecture. But here I just would like to give you guys a quick preview of how that this can work. So again, I, I tried to get rid of feedback, but I find out that actually feedback is quite useful, even for this application. So I'm going to use a um, a switch capacitor circuit to do my to do my comparator. Again, here I've put this to ground, so my I'm comparing my input voltage to ground. I could also tie this to a reference voltage, right? And the circuit would work the same. So the idea is in phase one, I close. Let, let's draw this circuit. First of all, let's put in our offset voltage. So in reality. This is some offset voltage, right? And so what does the circuit look like in phase one? I can just draw it here. So in phase one, switches labeled with phi one are closed. And so I'm putting my op amp in unity gain configuration. And so now you're all, all of a sudden concerned because I'm using an op amp, right? So I have to deal with that, and we will deal with it. Uh, and then I'm also grounding this side and disconnecting the input. OK, so why do I do this? What's the advantage of doing this in phase one? 
Well, if you remember back to switch capacitor circuits, we had kind of two phases. In phase one, we would kind of reset everything to zero state. And then in phase two, we connect the amplifier. Uh, let's say we charge up some input capacitor. Also in phase one, we could charge up some capacitor to the input voltage. And then phase two, we transfer the charge of that input uh, onto our op amp, which provides us some gain. Here, we're going to do we're going to do something similar, but the advantage is that in phase one, I'm charging up my capacitor to the offset voltage, right? So if this is a, a very good op amp, I've got it in unit of gain configuration. The error signal here is practically zero, right? It's um, if this is a very high gain amplifier, so this voltage here is also charged to be offset which means that this capacitor is going to store charge, enough charge to produce a voltage V offset at this node. Right? And then in phase two, in phase two, I actually connect the input. This uh, switch is closed. I open the amplifier loop. And so now it's acting just like a high gain amplifier. And so now this capacitor, so now the input voltage is V in plus V offset, and I'm subtracting an offset. So the effect of this offset goes away. And so this is a very nice technique uh, as long as I can, you know, properly store this voltage, right? If I have leakage and other issues, this voltage may change in this time. But if I do this fast enough, I don't expect leakage to, to be sufficient to actually uh, take away from this voltage. Unfortunately, I need ideal switches, right? If I don't have real switches, if I don't have ideal switches, um, potentially I'm going to get what's called charge injection, which means that real switches also unfortunately store charge, right? They store charge in their channel, they store charge in their overlap capacitances, and when they change state, that charge comes and goes, right? And it could come and go from this capacitor, in which case it would change the offset that I'm trying to cancel. So if I really want to design this well, I have to take the switch design into consideration. We'll talk about that in another lecture. OK. Anybody have an idea of how I could use an op amp and still not have a speed penalty? All right, we just talked about op amps are no good because there's a big speed penalty. Now I'm saying, well, it would be nice to use an op amp after all because I could store this offset voltage. Okay, Michael. Is there a way to dynamically remove the, the feedback? Uh, which feedback? Like the compensation, like the internal yeah, compensation. Precisely. I only need the compensation in this stage, right? In this stage, I've got feedback and I need it to be stable. But this is a switch system, so maybe what I can do is in this state, remove that compensation cap. Okay, so here, here's a simple circuit that does that. Again, you can dream up of many, but this is the simplest. So I've got a <coughs> two-stage amplifier. And uh, there's the second stage. And the second stage, I've compensated with a Miller cap. And so during stage one, when I've got unity gain configuration, this Miller cap is hooked up and the system is stable. And state two, this switch is open and this capacitor is now dangling and there is no feedback around this. And so this now becomes much, much faster. And so how fast? Well, it depends on where the dominant pole is. 
uh, is it here or is it here? But it doesn't matter, right? Because even if these are on the same order of magnitude, I know my speed will be roughly one half the speed of one of the poles. So this is how we're going to implement this amplifier. Okay, questions? All right. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> we've looked at the preamp. If we go back to this very first picture, we now see that we can design this preamp. We can make it pretty fast. We use a multi-stage amplifier, maybe two, three stages. Um, we could also use an op amp <clears throat> and get very good precision by canceling the offset. But we have to make sure to disconnect the compensation capacitor. Uh, what about the latch, right? I mean. We can make this part fast enough, but is the latch going to now give us problems? How fast is a latch? So let's calculate the time constant of a latch. And we'll just analyze a very simple latch, which is two inverters connected to each other. Call this node Vy, this node Vx. Well, <clears throat> for our purposes, the inverters are really just GM stages. And the reason we can model them as GM stages is that we're going to assume that the latch is initially programmed right at, at its trip point, right? right in the middle where it has high gain. And then we're going to unbalance the latch with a small signal and then that small signal is going to get amplified through this feedback loop and grow to a point where it's it's latched. Um, so let's just call this the load capacitance. Again, this is node Vy, this is node Vx, and these are just GM stages. Okay. Um, all right. So let let's uh, draw a small signal model. Almost. You don't want to draw a model because it's so simple, but it, it helps to draw one. So I have two stages. Let's call this node Vy, this node Vx. This is Cl, this is Rl, Rl, Cl. This is Gm Vx, this is Gm Vy. And <coughs> I can just write a couple of um, node equations. So here, the current I'm pulling out is equal to the minus CL dVy dt plus Vy over RL. That's the current through this branch. And a similar equation over here. GM Vy is equal to minus CL dVx dt plus Vx over RL. And I can write GM as AV over RL. And then I can multiply this equation through by RL. So let me do that here on the next page. So I can multiply both of these equations by RL. Let me define time constant as RL CL. So I have minus tau dVy dt plus Vy is equal to AV Vx. And same equation here with the x and y interchanged. Okay. So I have two equations and the key observation is what I really care about is the differential voltage. So let me define, let's call it delta V as Vy minus Vx. So what I really care about is how the difference between these two nodes progresses in time. And if you look at this equation, each term is just Vx or Vy. So I can just directly subtract one from the other. So here I have 
let me take the minus to this side, I have tau d delta v dt, where I've defined vy minus vx plus delta v is equal to minus av minus delta v. So this gives me plus delta v. And so my equation is tau derivative of delta v is equal to av minus 1. Actually, the tau is only here. av minus 1 delta v. Or the time constant of the entire system is this. In other words, this is a simple uh, first order differential equation. The delta v will grow. Let's say the initial delta v is delta v0. Then delta v will change exponentially with the time constant given by av minus 1 t over tau. That's a very important equation. So what can you conclude by looking at this equation? <clears throat> well, first of all, if you want to build a latch, what does AV need to be? Tim? Use the mic. More than one? Yeah, exactly. Because if this is less than one, this is a decaying exponential. So no matter what initial bias you give it, it decays back to zero. That's what we call a stable system. I want the system to be unstable. I want it to take that initial bias and, and exponentiate it, right? <clears throat> so clearly, AV should be bigger than 1. And of course, you recognize this as positive feedback with loop gain greater than 1. If AV is less than 1, I still have positive feedback, but it's stable. Okay. So the um, the time constant for the latch is just tau over a v minus one, and let's say I'm using a relatively large a v, maybe three or four. So this is approximately R L C L. <clears throat> times GMRL minus 1. Let's drop the minus 1. And lo and behold, I have my favorite result. I call this capital GM. I find that the latch time constant is 1 over the unity gain frequency. Seems like I can't get away from this unity gain frequency. It just pops up everywhere. And again, if this latch for the latch uh, what's CL? You know, CL is on the order of CGS times some constant, right? I have a few CGSs. Um, actually, if I, depending on how I design the latch, if it's just simple inverter, uh, I have, let's say, one or two CGSs hooked up, a NCGS and a PCGS. And of course, my GM is some constant. Let's call this constant 2, uh, mu c ox w over l, um, the effective, right, or v star, whatever you like to call it. And so, you know, the latch time constant is on the order of some constant times uh, 1 over omega t of my device, just like before. So interestingly enough, uh, we find that the latch has about the same speed as this input amplifier within some constant factor. And so then you may be tempted to just get rid of this amplifier, right? Why do I need this amplifier? What is it doing for me? I can just get all my gain out of my latch, and it's going to be just as fast as this amplifier. <clears throat> 
It's interesting that in the time constant of the latch, the resolution doesn't even come into play, right? Whereas here, it depends on how much gain you want. So it really seems like the way to design a fast comparator is to get rid of your preamp. And if we look at some practical uh, comparators, you'll find that, in fact, they'll have very few preamp stages, maybe one stage, maybe two stages. And that's mainly to get rid of this kickback problem and to improve the offset voltage. OK? Questions or comments? OK, here's a couple of uh, practical comparator designs we could look at. Let's see if we zoom into the circuit. OK, so <clears throat> apparently here at the input, we have a differential stage. This is, by the way, from a paper by Yukawa, <coughs> Yukawa uh, published in JSC in June 1985. Um, we have here a differential amplifier, and you'll, you'll recognize it's nothing but a diff pair, a current mirror load, and then some of these diode connected transistors, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, on this side, I have my reference voltage. Looks like maybe this is a flash converter. On this side, I have my input. And so I get some, some amount of gain out of this. And then I go into a latch. So this is my latch. And uh, if this picture is a little bit confusing. First of all, it says that in, 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 in this state, phi 1, these switches are on. So really, just imagine they're not even there. OK? So if they're not there, this is my cross-coupled device. This is my PMOS cross-coupled device, right? So this is my latch. Um, if you if you haven't seen this, who hasn't seen a cross-coupled device before? Okay, you guys have all seen this before, so no need to, to tell you where this comes from. Um, so this is my latch, and then this is another amplifier stage. So this is kind of like the second stage in the amplifier that directly drives the latch. So this amplifier stage biases the latch in one direction or the other. And in stage, so what's happening here is in the first stage, I'm actually shorting this node to ground, this node to VDD. And what that does for me is it takes out any kind of pre-bias in the latch, right? So you kind of want to, it's almost like taking the president that we talked about last lecture and erasing his memory, saying, you don't know anything. Right? Uh, what we do is, th that's to get rid of hysteresis, because we don't want the previous decision that we made to influence this decision. We want this decision to be all new. And so we pre-bias our latch to the trip point, And in state two, all these transistors are gone. So just imagine that they're gone. And, uh, and in that state, what happens is that now we, we give it the new bias, and then the positive feedback kicks up the bias and generates either a 1 or a 0. OK? Uh, any questions about this latch? Oh, yeah, these diodes. So the reason we put, anybody have a guess for why we use these diodes? Michael? It seems like you're limiting the, the swing at the top of the first stage. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, yeah, we want to improve the settling time. So we, let's say in one state, uh, without these diodes, if I apply a big differential input voltage, this will basically snap, right? So I'll get this voltage going very high, this voltage very low. And then in the next state, I need to actually bring this back to the zero point. So it's going to take me some time some slewing time to charge and discharge these capacitors. And so here, I insert these diodes, which limit the voltage swing here. Because I know that this stage doesn't need to swing that large. It's really this stage that's going to latch to the supply and ground. So this stage, maybe I need 500 millivolts of swing at most. So I design these diodes to limit the swing to that amount. <coughs> 
and that speeds up the recovery time. So this is the overload recovery that we talked about uh, in passing before. Uh, <clears throat> here's another latch, um, also a, a comparator. And if you go look in the literature, there's lots of these, and there's lots of ways of doing them. Um, this one is from uh, actually a Berkeley student, uh, Thomas Cho, and his advisor, Paul Gray. And if you look here, we have our differential amplifier. So can we zoom into just this part? So this is our differential amplifier. And it's kind of interesting what's happening here is instead of so the, the amplifier, the preamp, is really kind of built into the latch. If I look at this latch, again, forget about these switches in the middle. This is an inverter. This is an inverter. So this is a cross-coupled inverter. That's my latch. Um, in phase one, I do the same thing. I drive this voltage to VDD, and uh, that pre-biases my latch. In phase two, I turn this switch on, so now um, the latch is actually activated. And the way I pre-bias my latch is by putting in a differential voltage down here. So if my input voltage is larger than the reference or smaller than the reference, this source terminal of this, these devices will either go up or down. So I'm pre-biasing my latch over here. So really, the preamp is almost non-existent. It's part of the latch in this design. So if I look over here, this is a, a picture showing that effectively I'm modulating the resistance to ground on this node by changing but, but what the preamp is doing. Actually, if I did have a preamp, I don't. What the input is doing is modulating this resistance, which biases this latch in a certain state. Okay. Questions or comments? Okay. And then here's um, another latch. And this is kind of a very classic latch. Um, this one is from Asad Abidi at UCLA. It's very classic in the sense that most bipolar latches are actually built in this way. And the way this circuit works is I have my preamp. This is M1 and M2. And during phase one, I'm biasing up my preamp. So this bias current during phase clock bar is flowing over here. And this is just a differential amplifier. So diff pair current source. And I've got some diode connected loads. Okay. And so this during during phase one, this part of the circuit is inactive because this, this transistor is off, right? And so this is getting no current, so it's effectively not there. It's just loading my circuit. So this this is my amplifier during phase one. It's a preamp. During phase two, I take the current and switch it over to this side, right? So now the current's flowing through the latch. Um, during phase one, I turn this transistor on to take away the differential voltage. That's like the memory erasure operation. So this takes out the hysteresis. In phase two, this is not there. This is just a latch. And it takes the input voltage gained up and latches it to a value. Okay. This is a very nice circuit. One of the, the nice things about it is that it's drawing constant current because in one state, lets the current flow here, and the next state it takes the current and flows it here. And if you look in the literature, there's tons of comparators. I have a question, Michael? What about kickback mask for, for those latches? That's a good question. This the adva disadvantage of this device is kickback noise. And here it's very clear where the kickback comes from. I have feed-through capacitors here and here, and as this node changes, it will directly kick back voltage on the input of my amplifier. And that's a problem. So if you're going to use this in an application sensitive to kickback, you'd have to do something about that. What's an easy way to get rid of kickback? Okay, Christian? Cascode? Yeah, use a cascode device. So if you have the headroom, you add a cascode device, 
Now the output node changes, but the input node doesn't change too much. Uh, or you could do a preamp. Okay, um, I think we'll stop there with the latches and the comparators. Okay, so that's the conclusion of this topic. Uh, we're going to start a new topic. And the new topic is going to be <coughs> coupling mechanisms in the circuit package board environment. And I think in the beginning we talked about this a little bit, but it's a, it's a very important topic. And I think sometimes we overlook very basic things that seem basic but actually are not basic and uh, actually I can in introduce that over here so first of all what is coupling so coupling is anytime signals arrive at a node when they're not supposed to right and how does that happen well you've got interconnect all over your chip that means there's capacitive coupling between all the different uh, wires that cross each other or come in close proximity there's also inductive coupling, but on chip inductive coupling is not too much of an issue at lower frequencies and analog frequencies. Um, there's also your package. We talked about the package and the bond wires a few lectures back in the beginning. And then there's things like the supply and the substrate. You got this big conductive substrate sitting under your circuits and effectively every part of the circuit is coupled to every other part of the circuit through the substrate. So some of these things are actually very difficult, like the substrate. It's a very, very difficult to get your hand, get a handle on the substrate. Other parts of uh, coupling are actually very straightforward. We just need to be aware of them, and one of them is the supply. If we don't design our supplies correctly, this will be a source of a big problem, and we'll talk about that. But to give you an example of why it's important to, to, to teach this is that I have students who are very good at designing high frequency circuits uh, on chip but then when they actually have to build a board and put everything together you know things that look obvious okay I need VDD here so here's a pin for VDD doesn't work why not well you forgot to bypass that pin you forgot to isolate that pin you forgot to uh, you know so there's lots of issues that come up practical issues which we'll talk about in this lecture which make it which are very, you know, seem simple, but in fact can be quite subtle. Okay, so very quickly, let's review the package and uh, and talk about. Yeah, let's talk about the package and how it can impact what role it plays in coupling. Okay, so as, as you guys all know, you build a chip. And usually, you put bonding pads on your chip. So this chip might be a few millimeters on a side. And then it goes into a package where you have pins. And so you got to connect. And so in a low-cost package, the way you do that is you use these little bond wires. OK. And because these wires are right next to each other, they actually form little loops that can magnetically couple to each other. So let, let's, let's see how that happens. Let's say that I put VDD here and put VSS here. Okay. So this is my supply, this is my ground. This is a good idea. Right, I mean, it seems arbitrary, right? I have students or I've been in companies where people pick their pins kind of arbitrarily. They say, oh, you know, this is convenient. I have an empty spot here. Let me put VSS. Anybody want to comment on that? Okay, Lee? You get a large loop. Yeah, you VDD. get a large loop. Very good. So internally, VDD is connected to VSS through your circuit, through some on-chip bypass capacitor and and then on the board let's say this goes off to your battery right and so now I have this huge loop Let me use some color here so this is a huge loop 
and I get magnetic flux here and you might say well who cares about magnetic flux because this is a DC current I'm drawing a DC current so there is no flux am I actually drawing a DC current So what, what kind of current would you expect to be drawn? Isn't it, doesn't it vary a lot just based on what, just like the switching and stuff in the circuit or whatever happens? Yeah, it depends on what's in there, right? If I've got, for instance, a, an analog class A circuit, and I've designed it really well, I've got plenty of bypass capacitance on chip, then yeah, it would draw a DC current. But let's say I've got a digital circuit on there, right? Today you can't design a chip without also putting digital on there, right? So I've got a bunch of digital stuff in here and some analog stuff. Well, digital circuits, every clock cycle, short the power supply, right? I get the crowbar current. They also are charging and discharging capacitors. And so the current that I'm drawing is proportional to the capacitance, let's just talk about charging and discharging currents. It's proportional to the capacitance and the rate at which I'm changing voltages. Well, how much capacitance is on chip? Depends on how much, let's say we're just talking about logic. How much logic do I have on chip? Right. At any one time, not all of it is going to be changing, right? Some fraction of it's going to be changing. Let's just plug in a number. Let's say I've got 100 picofarads of charging and discharging. Yes, I really just grabbed that number right out of the air. And let's say that I'm charging and discharging up to a volt, so one volt supply. And the time I'm doing it is, let's say, on the order of gigahertz. So let's say on the order of nanoseconds. So how much current does that translate into? So this is 100 times 10 to the minus 3 right or a hundred millivolts I'm sorry hundred milliamps okay that's actually a substantial amount of current ah. <laughs> I'm sick today so I have a good excuse um, that's actually a substantial amount of current right hundred milliamps of current is getting basically drawn in and out every cycle it's not a DC current. I'm drawing 0.1 amps in and out of this chip. So there is going to be substantial magnetic flux. Well, let's just focus on the self-inductance, right? I can model this system now as having some inductance, right? And what kind of self-inductance am I going to get? Well, with these bond wires as I've drawn them here, I could easily get 10 nanohenries. It's quite, you know, this loop, right? It depends on the size of this loop, so it depends on the board. But let's say that I'm really careful and I do a good job and I put a huge capacitor right here. So that cuts the loop. So this current, this AC current, is not coming from my supply, it's coming from this capacitor. So then that minimizes the size of the loop and I get about 10 nanohenries of inductance. Okay? Is that a problem? Okay. Saying you the problem. Is that an LDIDT drop? Yeah, well, how much voltage drop do I get across this inductor? Well, it's proportional again to the change in the current, change in time times the inductance. So let's run the number. So I get 10 times 10 nano times delta I is 0.1 amps and delta T is 1 nanosecond. So the nanos cancel out and I have 1 volt. That means my supply voltage has 1 volt of ripple on it. Right? Is that okay? No, right? Because my voltage supply is a volt. So uh, clearly, 
you might say, well, I'll just design a two volt supply. Well, what if, what's the problem with doing that? Well, if you're at a, if there's a time that nobody is switching, then all of a sudden you've got two volts. Instead of one volt, you have two volts, and all the transistors break down, right? So they can't do that. Okay. So the first problem with this bad package layout is that we get lots of um, self-inductance. Well, what's the second problem? If you're designing an analog circuit, and let's say it's trying to resolve a 10 microvolt signal, do you want to live in this environment where you've got, you know, a volt of ripple? Or let's say I do a good job and I bring it down to 100 millivolts. All right. So how are you going to get away from this environment if you're an analog circuit? Yes. I mean, is it just concerned about the, the supply voltage to use internal regulators? But it doesn't stop you with the, like, the cross and all this stuff. Yeah, let, let's focus on... <clears throat> you're absolutely right. We can use internal regulators to try to clean up our supply. But let's just see what we can do on the package side. Can I do something with my pin assignments to help the situation? Okay, Christian. Well, you can bring you can bring VDD and VSS to the same side and reduce the loop size. Yeah, I can reduce the loop size, right? And that would let maybe go from one volt to 100 millivolts. And also put a, a large cap right near the pins as close as possible. Let's say I've done that. I'm down to 100 millivolts. Would you stick your analog circuits on that supply? Debo. Isolate analog and digital VDDs. Yeah, very simple, right? Instead of using so this would be VSS, VDD for digital. And then I would come in with VDD analog and VSS analog. So I have actually my own supply voltages, separate supply voltages for my analog circuits. Because my analog circuits, let's say, so let's say this is digital and this is analog. So as you suggested, I'm going to now use pins right next to each other. This is VDD, this is VSS. So that cuts this loop down. And I put, as Christian suggested, a capacitor right there. That cuts the loop down to here. And then on the other side, I use a analog supply, which is separate. So now here there's ripple, let's say on the order of 100 millivolts. And the reason I say 100 millivolts is maybe by doing this I cut the loop area down by 10 so my inductance now is a nanohenry instead of 10 nanohenries, right? And then over here I'm drawing a nearly constant current. Say it's a class A analog circuit and so there's no voltage ripple. Or is there? going to be voltage ripple on the analog supply? Aren't you going to get coupling between the two loops? Yeah. Mutual inductance. So some fraction of this magnetic flux will be incident over here. And so this is the mutual inductance. And so s instead of getting, so let's say this current is I1, this current is I2. So the voltage induced on this loop is L1 DI1 DT plus M DI2 DT. And in this case, DI1 DT is roughly zero because I'm drawing a DC current on my analog supply. And so what I pick up is just M times DI2 DT. And how big is M? It's probably a factor of, of 10 smaller than L. So instead of getting 1 nanohenry of mutual, you might get 0.1 nanohenry. So now we're down to 10 millivolts. So V ripple 
on the analog supply is still 10 millivolts. Even despite everything we've done here, we still have 10 millivolts of ripple. Okay, Debo? Uh, does the mutual inductance like depend upon the distance or, the, or even the orientation of the two loops? It does, of course. Um, the mutual inductance drops roughly logarithmically with distance. So it doesn't help too much to go far away. Uh, orientation also helps. So if you can imagine the magnetic flux here of this loop is very much strong on the, the sides, right? If you think about the strength of the magnetic field here versus here, um, there, there is a, a way of doing this calculation or thinking about this in terms of partial, what's called partial inductances. So I can think of the total inductance as being this partial inductance plus this partial inductance and so on and so forth. And then I can look at the magnetic coupling between here as a sum of partial inductances. And the, the, the advantage of doing that is you realize that when things are perpendicular, they do not couple partially. So if I had a loop over here, say another cap here, then if I look at the mutual inductance, if I want to calculate the mutual inductance between these two loops, it's a sum of all the pair mutual and partial mutual inductances. And so for instance, the partial inductance of this branch with this branch is zero because they're perpendicular. And similar thing here. So if I put my loop over here, I actually end up getting less coupling than putting it over here. And so orientation matters. Um, but it, I guess the, the at the end of the day, no matter what you do, you're going to end up with some level of ripple. Maybe you do really good engineering, you buy a good package, it's down to a millivolt. So you have to live with this ripple. And, and uh, Michael suggested that we put regulators right on chip. Yeah, that's a good solution. A regulator can reject the ripples. Something else you can do, which is even cheaper, what you can do is you can use isolation and time. In other words, don't do anything analog if you're doing things digital and vice versa. So if, if you're designing, again, this is the advantage of using a switched analog system. If you're using a continuous analog system, it's on all the time and it's going to pick up all the noise. But if I can turn on and off my analog system, then what I can do is, let's say this is my system clock and let's say it's running at a gigahertz. And let's say that I'm doing analog operations every 10 megahertz. So I can wait 100 cycles and then just skip a clock cycle. And when I skip, skip the clock cycle, all the digital stuff turns off, and then I do my analog processing. Again, 99 cycles of digital and then one analog cycle. And so I slow down my digital clock a little bit, right, 1%. But instead, what I gain is I don't have to worry about analog to digital coupling. Okay. Okay, so that's the package. Um, interestingly enough, you may do a really good job with your package, and you give it to your customer, and you say, okay, it works, no problem. And your customer says, you know what, it doesn't work. I, I test my system and it doesn't work. And you think, that's weird because we gave our customer really good chips. This is an important customer, so we cherry-picked our chips and gave them the best ones, and those aren't working. What's going on? Well, here it is. You gave your customer the fast corner, which means they're switching even faster. So if you had tested a regular corner, and they're testing a fast corner, their switching noise is even higher because the derivatives are larger. So beware that you test your package part uh, with, you know, basically with fast transistors. And one way to make fast transistors is cool the chip down, right? Cooling it down, the mobility gets higher, things run faster, and that will, if, if you cool your chip and still you don't have any kind of interference issues, you know that probably you won't in the field. 
if your customer is, is a military, they actually will test your chip at very cool temperatures. And if it doesn't work at these cool temperatures, you won't be able to sell your parts. The other things that we can do is use differential circuits. And uh, the idea of using a differential circuit is what if let's say this pin here is very noisy and if I'm using a, a single-ended input I'm gonna pick up a lot of noise right the observation is that if I look at a pin that's right next to it, it probably will pick up the same noise. They're close together, so for the most part, I should pick up the same noise on this adjacent pin. Well, then use differential. So here, if I use a differential amplifier, the noise that I pick up is common mode. And so it gets rejected by the common mode of my amplifier, right? So differential circuits are naturally very good at rejecting common mode. And because a lot of noise on chip is common mode, right, this noise might be due to this digital block. All of it flows out here and presents a lot of common no mode noise to my analog system. Just going differential can help a lot. And this is why universally, analog circuits are differential. You just you get extra isolation for free, you'd be stupid not to use it. In addition to getting better dynamic range as we discussed. Okay, um, the next thing we should talk about is the power supply. And if you build a chip Let's say, I'll use an example. Let's say we have a two-chip solution. I have a digital chip, and I have an analog chip. And I need to power them up. And so, you know, now I'm, I mean these are separate chips. I have only one battery, right? So I've got a share. So maybe I have a regulator, and this generates, let's say, three volts. And I do something like this. Okay, Let's say you're a new grad student, you've never built a circuit before, or you're an undergrad, and you say, hey, I want to try this, and you, you do this. Okay, what, What's the problem with doing this? If, if we're careful, we make sure the package is well designed, there's no issues with the package. Just take the same idea on the package scale and scale it up, right? All the same problems. What, what's the problem? Well, the ground symbol, in my opinion, is one of the most dangerous and one of the most convenient symbols in the world. Because what does it mean, right? It can mean a lot of different things. It could mean that there's a physical wire connecting them. It could mean that there's a ground plane on your board, and they're all connected to the ground plane, right? So this might be a via down to a ground plane. It could even mean they're hooked up into the earth, right? <laughs> and we're using the earth itself as a ground plane. Probably not, right? Um, or it could be the chassis of a car, if this is something that goes into a car, or the chassis of a, a cell phone. So be careful. Always, you know, if, if you just draw the symbol and you give it to somebody and they build a board for you, you have no idea where your grounds are right so what happens is that if this digital chip is drawing again AC current and it's drawing it from this regulator it basically draws the current here comes out of ground and then somehow magically it gets back over here maybe it's the ground plane right what's the problem same thing right this magnetic flux inductance this isn't going to work okay what about this regulator 
what's the output impedance of this regulator? I hear Lee, was that you? Use the mic. It's low. Yeah, if this is a good regulator, you look in the manufacturer's data sheet, or if you've designed it, you've used lots of feedback, and the output impedance might be milliohms, right? So this is a very good voltage source. Does this digital chip see milliohms? Let's forget about this inductance for a moment. You still have the, the resistance of the wires? It's a superconductor. <laughs> At AC, you see higher impedance. Yeah, remember that the reason this impedance is so low is loop gain. But once you lose your loop gain, this impedance goes way up. So if I were to plot the impedance versus frequency, it does something like that. What's this cutoff frequency typically? Depends on the part, right? You can go look in the manufacturer's data sheet. But it's not going to be too high because this is a regulator. It's got a big power transistor in it. That big power transistor has lots of capacitance. If you guys took 140, you probably designed one of these regulators. And you know it's not so easy. So this thing is on the order of kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, but not gigahertz. So from a gigahertz perspective, this regulator is dead. It can give you nothing. So not only do I have all this inductance slowing me down, I've also got this regulator which just cannot supply the current. So what's the solution? <laughs> yeah, okay, I put a capacitor here. Put a big capacitor, right? Because this capacitor needs to supply all the AC current in one cycle. What kind of capacitor might you use? Big capacitor. Electrolytic. Okay, electrolytic. Is that going to work? It's a big capacitor. Will it supply a gigahertz signal? No. Yeah, if you look at data sheet of a typical electrolytic capacitor, it has a self-resonant frequency. It has lead inductance. Uh, it has series resistance, effective series resistance. And so you'll find that it also may work up to, you know, a few hundred kilohertz. After that, it's dead. So what do you do? Use another kind of capacitor, right? You might use a ceramic capacitor. So if you look at the typical board, you'll find several capacitors in parallel. And you say, why do they do that? You know, why this waste space? Well, <laughs> they're putting different kinds of capacitors down. Different kinds of capacitors which cover different frequency ranges. So this will cover the low frequencies. This small one will cover the high frequencies. And, of course, if you're smart, you'll move these capacitors as close as you can to the chip. Right? Okay, we have a couple minutes, so I will, one one last point. So it looks like we've done a pretty good job now. We've got these capacitors close by, right? And uh, now this digital circuit is, is drawing from this capacitor. This analog circuit is drawing from this capacitor. Is there something else I need to worry about? What about the isolation between the digital and the analog? Am I going to have ripple on this analog node? Again, it depends a lot on how you set things up. But if you think about it, this digital circuit is drawing a lot of current from these capacitors, right? And it also sees these nearby capacitors. It says, hey, you can help me out too. Right? I don't. If I, if I have to get to the regulator, that's 100 nanohenries away, you're just half a nanohenry away. Give me some of your charge. So in fact, what you'll find is that you will have this 
you, you intended this to only work for your analog, but instead it's acting as the additional bypass for your digital. So what's the solution? How do you isolate this guy from this guy? Cross connected to the regulator? I mean, like star connected to the regulator? Star connection might help. What's a very easy thing I can do? How can I make this guy look far away, even though he's not? Resistance. Resistance? Well, that's not good because now I got an IR drop across here and I'm dissipating power. Yeah, use an inductor. So now I'm using a big inductor here that says, ah, leave me alone. You're not going to be able to take AC current from me. Got to go to the regulator. What's the problem with an inductor? Would you do this? Build a circuit like this? I can tell you, if you turn on the power supply, it's going to ring like crazy, right? Got caps everywhere. I've got inductors everywhere. I've got a nth order network. So how do I kill resonance? I need to DQ the circuit, right? And the way I usually do that is I buy a special inductor that has very low DC resistance but has high AC resistance. It uses a ferrite. It's called a ferrite bead. And this ferrite bead gives me high inductance and it gives me very lossy inductance. So it DQs the network, but at the same time, it doesn't have DC resistance, so it doesn't dissipate any power for just the signal currents. So if you look at a, a typical board, it's got lots of what they call ferrite beads everywhere. Okay, going over time. We'll continue next time.